Perfect. I mean, we've got half an hour. So what I'm going to do is probably about 15 minutes of uh, um, uh, presenting the concept of mapping. And then I've got some exercises for you to do. Uh, Claire's got me up early in the morning. I'm terrible in the morning. Uh, I'm terribly mean as well. So I've got you some exercises which we can do on Mirrorboard, which will hopefully show you this stuff. So let me make this full screen, quickly go through this. Um, I'm going to talk about maps. I want to talk about the origin of where this came from. Um, I'm going to talk about why maps matter. And then I'm going to talk about patterns. Because uh, one of the things about maps is you learn an awful lot of patterns about change. So for me, this started 17 years ago. Uh, I was working for this company, Fatango, online photo service, uh, very profitable. Uh, revenue growing. I had a slight problem though, the CEO of the company was completely clueless. Uh, they were making stuff up as they went along. I know this because I happen to be the CEO. Um, so I used to come up with all these wonderful statements about strategy. Um, our strategy is customer focused, we will lead an innovative effort in the market for our use of uh, agile techniques and open source. I was uh, uh, heavily involved in the open source community. Um, Ken Beck uh, is a, a friend of mine. We, we adopted extreme programming back in the late, uh, uh, what, early 2000s. Um, but the problem with this, this sort of vision strategy statement is I literally pinched it from another company uh, and just changed a few words, that was all. Um, that was the limit of my ability. So I started reading everything I could find on the issue of strategy. I was getting nowhere. And then I ended up in a bookshop in London uh, in Charing Cross. And I was talking to the bookseller and she persuaded me to buy two copies of The Art of War. They're all translations, so they're all different. And I'm very grateful for that um, because it was in the sec reading of the second one, I noticed a particular pattern. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in, in competition one have a purpose and moral imperative to do something, to understand your landscape that you're competing in, uh, three, understand uh, climatic patterns, the heavens, how the, uh, um, uh, the weather, uh, how the uh, landscape is changing. Then you get into doctrine, principles of organization, then you get into leadership and gameplay. And this overlap with something else, uh, which was the uh, work of the mad major, John Boyd, uh, known as the Uyuyu, loop uh, heavily used in political uh, circles unfortunately these days as well as obviously the military so the first o of the uh, ooda loop is to observe the environment that's what landscape climatic patterns are about uh, the second o is um uh, orient around the space this is what the doctrine of principles are about and then you have to decide where you're going to attack and then you act and it's a cycle and at the heart of this are two wires, uh, the wife purpose, uh, your, your uh, moral imperative to do something, and the wife movement. Uh, why do I make this choice over that choice? And those are fundamentally different things. Uh, so if you think of a game of chess, the wife purpose might be to win the game. Uh, the why of movement is, do I move this piece or that piece? And at the heart of this was this idea of landscape. And um, so that got me sort of really interested into the subject of uh, um, sort of uh, um, um, the use of maps. And I started looking into military history because military history we teach through maps. So this is the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, this is Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general. Uh, and they had the Persians invading. And um, so they used the map to, to determine what to do. You know, they could block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae, where a smaller number of troops could defend against a larger force. There's about you know 170,000 odd Persians. There are about 4,000 Greeks um, in the army, including uh, 300 Spans. And this is where we get the story for the 300 from. And I was looking at this and thinking, well, how do we? determine you know we're, we're competing against others and when we're competing against others um, or competition we might be collaborating with some cooperating with others conflicting uh, with another group i mean uh, they're all uh, aspects of competition how do we determine what to do and we used something called swats uh, these uh, strengths weaknesses opportunities threats diagrams so i created a swap for this battle uh, strength, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave, uh, weaknesses, evils might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up, 
opportunities. Get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. Uh, and the threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced in a few thousand years. And I just put those next to each other and asked, what would you use to communicate determined strategy in battle? Position and movement described by some sort of map or uh, a swap diagram. Well, and it's obvious, you know, you use position and movement described by a map. And then I looked at my business and I was like, well, I'm just using these magic frameworks. So I asked everybody uh, in the organization, oh, okay, um, I think the problem, the reason why I don't understand what I'm doing is I've got no maps. Uh, send me all your maps. And so people sent me loads of maps, uh, my maps, um, uh, customer journey maps, business process maps. I mean, they were just like lots and lots of maps and systems maps. And so I took one of these systems maps, and this is for the online photo service. Uh, and I took a look at the map and I took one component, customer relationship management, and I moved it across the map and asked, how has that, that changed? And the answer is, um, it hasn't changed. And that's really odd, because if I take a geographical map and I shift Australia and put it next to the UK, that definitely has changed. So um, why hasn't it changed here? And the answer is, all of these maps had one thing in common. Uh, they were not maps, they were graphs. So to explain the difference, uh, these three graphs are identical. Um, the three images at the top, they're all graphs. So Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, uh, places in the UK connected by two roads. Those three images and the three graphs are identical. Uh, these three maps are completely different. The, the difference between um, a map and a graph is that in a map, space has meaning, uh, which, um, and um, which is why they're good at looking at landscapes. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at political landscapes or cultural landscapes or economics landscapes or physical uh, and territorial landscapes. I mean, if you're going to use a map to look at that landscape, then your map space has to have meaning. And unfortunately, all the things we had, which were called maps, my maps, business process maps, customer journey maps, all that sort of stuff, uh, they no, they were maps, they were all graphs. Um, now, in order to be a map, uh, you need three basic characteristics. You need anchor, uh, position and movement. So something like magnetic north, position of pieces. This is north, south, east or west of this. And then you need consistency of movement. If I'm going north, I'm going north. If I'm going south, I'm going south. So I decided to do that for my business. Um, I don't usually use the one for the business because it's a bit boring for online photo services. So uh, to make things simpler, I've got a map for a tea shop. So what's my anchor going to be? Well, there can be several. Uh, there's the public, hopefully, who want to consume cups of tea. There's the business who wants to make revenue from selling cups of tea. Uh, there is the um, uh, maybe the government who needs to regulate say, food standards, health, and uh, hygiene, all this sort of stuff. Um, so there can be several anchors at any one time. I'll just pick two here, public and business. Uh, public wants to drink cups of tea, we hope, and business needs to sell cups of tea. Great. Well, a cup of tea has needs. It needs tea. It needs a cup. It needs hot water. And hot water has needs. It needs cold water. It needs a kettle. A kettle has needs. It needs power. So what you've got is a chain of needs. And of course, the further you go down the chain, the less visible things become. So if you're a member of the public, the cup of tea is very visible. The power to heat the kettle. Well, you don't normally concern yourself with the power used in making the cup of tea, um, unless somebody wants to make it more visible by creating a new line in the chain, maybe environmental status or something. All right, this is a graph though. This is not a map. This gives you anchor position. To turn it into a map, we have to add movement. And it turns out all of these different nodes are forms of capital. And they evolve through a, if there is a competition, uh, any of the forms of competition, conflict, collaboration, cooperation, all have the same effect. Um, they will force something to evolve. So you start off with the, the genesis of uh, novel and new items. You get custom built examples of uh, uh, things. Then you get the introduction of products and rental services and eventually commodity and utility services. So simply taking my graph and going, right, how evolved is this component? Um, turns it into a map, and that is a map. If I move anything on this map, it changes the meaning of the map.
Now we normally show this with a line on the side, just to remind people that you're going up and down the chain. And you know, if there is competition, things will evolve. So you put a line at the bottom. They're not really axes, but uh, it helps people for some reason. This nice scaffolding, um, but you can get rid of those. Now what I'm doing here is I'm exposing my assumptions uh, about a tea shop. So you can look at this and go, well, why have you got kettle and custom built? Surely that should be more of a commodity. And uh, so th this is actually quite a powerful um, thing, actually. Uh, and the reason why I say that is normally organizations are run on stories. And we tell everybody to be a great leader, you've got to be a great storyteller. The problem with that is when you challenge somebody's story, you're, you're actually challenging their leadership ability, which is why people get very, very defensive. They come up with stories, you challenge it, they're like, Rrr. Um, by getting their stories uh, into a map, uh, so all their assumptions on the map. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, when I challenge, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying the map is wrong. So you neatly sort of <laughs> sidestep up, off the political issues uh, which occur. And once you start using maps, you start discovering all these patterns. And, uh, and open sources are, for example, a very powerful way of driving things uh, from the left to the to the right. Uh, and so a way of, well, uh, collaborating in this case with others. Um, uh, or increasing the level of collaboration, which has the effect of actually shifting things much, much more from the left to the right. So industrializing a space. And there's a, a huge number of reasons why you would do that. I mean, I used to run strategy for a company called uh, uh, Canonical. They provide something called Ubuntu. And um, I mean, we use maps to map out the whole computing space back in 2008. We're up against uh, Red Hat and Microsoft, and we were 3% of the operating system. And we use the maps to work out where to attack and um, uh, you know where to work with others, where to collaborate, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and we spent half a, I spent half a million. It took us eighteen months. We took seventy percent of all cloud computing, um, which was quite incredible feat. Um, and the reason why we were able to do this is because we actually understood the landscape and we were competing against others who who didn't. Right, so this sort of maps, um, you know, used all, all over the world, uh, sexual health campaigns in Brazil to putting uh, satellites up in space, uh, this planet and NASA, uh, the team working on this when they're coordinating together, we're using maps. Uh, we did a lot of this stuff within UK government, um, uh, under Francis Maud and with Liam Maxwell, uh, saved um, uh, billions, actually, uh, by the simple act of mapping stuff out. Um, once you do start mapping, you start to learn patterns. So a pattern I often use is this one here. Um, uh, it's uh, HS2 High Speed Rail, big heavy engineering project. Uh, this is James Finley, uh, the CIO of HS2, or former CIO of HS2. Uh, had a problem. And that problem was how to build HS2 in a, a virtual world. Uh, the reason why you would build HS2 in a virtual world is it's cheaper uh, to actually dig up the English, well, to dig up a, a virtual world than it is the English countryside and go, whoops, we've got it wrong. Um, so back in 2012, that was the plan. This is the systems graph. It's not a map. And James's issue was how do I manage this? Um, so typically in government, what we would do is outsource it all, break it into small Simon, you've gone on mute there. If you'd like to, I don't know how that happened. Well, I don't know. I didn't press anything. There we are. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you lovely now. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, where did I get to? When, when did I go on mute? Do you know? <laughs> Just a few seconds ago, you were telling us about this one. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. So this is the systems graph for uh, building this uh, HS2 in a virtual world. This is how we normally do things uh, in government. We break it down into lots, we used to, and uh, outsource it all. So you go lot one engineering, all the engineering stuff put together, a uh, lot to user experience. I mean, and these projects will invariably fail, cost overrun, all the rest of it be a, pretty much of a disaster. So um, what James did, and this is back in 2012, he's Sunday lunchtime. Uh, he basically sat down and mapped it, sent me the map and said, right, how do you manage this? And this is easy because uh, I faced this problem in 2006. 
what we'd learned uh, is, of course, everything starts on the left in this uncharted chaotic space, it evolves over time, becomes more industrialized. And um, what we've learned is that, you know, you use different methods. So extreme programming uh, was very good on the left hand side, agile in house development, because it's very good at reducing the cost of change. And that changes the norm on the left hand side of this uncharted space. Uh, but on the right hand side, Six Sigma outsourcing absolutely wins the day because it's all about reducing deviation, which is what you want. You don't want change, you want no change. In the middle, you know, you're into the world of using things like Scrum MVP because you're all about learning reducing waste. So you simply take that stuff and just apply it to a map. And so you go, right, we're going to use appropriate methods. Uh, so on the right hand side, we'll outsource, uh, we'll buy off the shelf products, or if we're going to build, we use sort of lean methods in the middle. The left hand stuff, we're going to build in house with agile techniques. And so, you know, there's a world of difference between obviously uh, using agile, which is what we're doing here, uh, as in extreme programming on the left, and being agile, which requires you to use appropriate methods. So, you know, being agile requires you to use things like Six Sigma, et cetera. Uh, if you try and use one size fits all methods, well, uh, you invariably uh, you get problems, and you can see this um, uh, with the contracts. So, if I take um, lot one engineering, which was uh, sort of their idea for a contract, if I just apply it to a map, that's lot one engineering. I know this contract's failed before I've even signed the paperwork. Now, uh, the reason for this is the stuff on the right hand side we can actually define the contract so it will be efficiently treated and the stuff on the left hand side will inevitably incur excessive change control costs uh, because we can't actually define it in a contract so you know uh, because we're still learning about that space it's uncharted um several of the most common things that i see in in most systems it doesn't matter whether i'm talking about political systems or technology systems is people don't understand the users they don't understand the user needs they don't understand the components involved they don't understand how evolved the components they're constantly trying to do one size fits all methodology um now we learn these patterns through a process called pre-mortem challenge and post-mortem learning so we use the maps before we do stuff and that saves us millions uh, because we don't custom build kettles and then we go and do it and then we come back and we look at the map and what changed and we do pre post-mortem learning i mean it's important to do both of those and that's how we learn patterns and there's about Oh, 30 climactic patterns which we use for anticipation of change in the market. Things like, you know, everything will evolve, everything shifts from the left to the right. Um, then there's about 40 principles, doctrine. Uh, these are universally useful patterns uh, for organization. And then there's about 100 different forms of gameplay. And uh, you, you can read about them. There's lots of books out there uh, now appearing. So uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, their second ever book is uh, Reaching Cloud Velocity. Uh, they've got about 17 pages of mapping in here, uh, including an entire method. Uh, well, uh, I developed a method back in 2005 called ILC. It's a, it's a particular ecosystem play way of decimating industry after industry. They're very good at this sort of stuff. Um, and it's the same with you know what we learned with Ubuntu. If you're competing against others, then they can't see the environment. It gives you such a huge advantage. Anyway, these days, and this uh, where Claire um, dragged me into this, is I've got uh, 207 people working in research teams, mapping out everything from government to agriculture to healthcare to construction to defence, uh, and we're looking for patterns of change of investment in those spaces. And so now I want to zoom over onto Miro. So let me just stop sharing this for a second. I unfortunately I can't see um, Zoom, uh, sorry, uh, Slack. So if you've got any questions, uh, I won't be able to see those. I hopefully we'll get on to Slack a bit later. Um, let's have a look. I've got the link to the mirror board. Let's see how many of you are on the mirror board. We've got 12 of you on the mirror board. Fantastic. Uh, you'll have to share the link uh, in uh, Slack itself. And let's go on to the mirror board. I will share that so those of you who are not on it can actually see the screen. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Screen one. There we are. Let's get rid of all the people. Hang on a second. Where, how long do we have roughly?
Sorry, you've got you've got about uh, well, you've got about ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. Good. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you all to me. Um, let's have a look. The first section is a tea shop. I I I, I you know I'm a great believer in actually doing getting hands on with things. So um, normally uh, when mapping out a space, I will start by going, you know, simple questions. Who are the users? What are their needs? That's, uh, that's the first thing. And it's amazing, actually, how many people don't understand who their users are. Um, you know, I, I, I was working with a prison service and, you know, they talk about the judiciary and the public and everything else. And it took ages for them to re realize prisoners actually have needs. Um, so you start off with identifying who the users are and what their needs are. The next thing uh, you start going, right, what is the chain? Now, this is a graph. Um, so you go public, needs tea, hot water, kettle, etc. And, you know, I've got some other components here. I've got a business. Maybe we'll say business needs revenue. We'll, we'll link those in there. Revenue needs selling of cups of tea. Uh, and we can also say tea needs, uh, or say tea needs milk, maybe. Okay. I'm sure there's many other things that can be done. Um, and then what you do is you take that and you start asking yourself the question, how evolved are these components? Is it Genesis, novel and new, first time in the things that have ever been done, custom built examples? Is it more products and rental, more commodity or utility services? Um, so if you get a business, that's probably, that sounds pretty commodity like, and revenue, that's pretty well understood, well defined. So we'll just put those over there. Nothing special about milk either. So we're just, and you just go through building your map that way. Now we've got 16 people on the board. Uh, let me bring you all to me. Da, 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 da. What I'm going to do is I'll put a timer up. I'll give you um, three minutes. Have a go, put some post-it notes on there. Simple way, you know, uh, you can take a sticky note or you can just copy these or put a box down there. Add them onto the tea shop if there's other things. I see Rob's already in there as well. Um, uh, well let's give you three minutes, see what else you can add, what, what else we think a tea shop needs. Cups, yeah. Cake. Oh, definitely, definitely need some cake. So I actually uh, used to work in uh, 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 <laughs> a tea shop, but of course, all, all the cakes, you know, we, you, you say they're homemade. What that basically means is that they're, they're mass produced and you've just sprinkled something on top at the very end, because that's all you need to do uh, to, to say they're homemade. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be very cruel and I'm going to drag cake. You know, uh, this is one of the beauties about uh, the map is you can put your assumptions down. Others, you know, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I think the map uh, cake is far more of the product heading towards more of the commodity. Uh, I think I'm going to say the same with scones as well. And uh, then we can get into a debate about, you know, whether it should be. Oh, look, now we've got kitchens, menus. I think menus are pretty sort of standard sort of commodity type thing okay the actual data on the menu may vary from but there's nothing special about menus uh employees who are going to be harsh and i'm gonna say it's more over here oh register that's a good one point of sale yeah because obviously we want to make revenue so revenue needs us to have some sort of point of sale um and obviously uh people buying your cups of tea don't want to be arrested for theft um so that's a good one to have i'm gonna say again i'm gonna say point of sale that's you know quite commodity like uh though we have a terrible tendency of custom building this stuff all over the place um uh dishwashers yeah 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 brand yeah okay i'm gonna just again say dishwashing is sort of uh, sort of yeah i tend to put it over here an online shop yeah yeah okay um 
newspapers, dishwasher. We've got two lots of uh, support for dishwasher here as well. Till, yeah, we can mix that up with registers. So one of the things you do find with maps is that when you start to get many maps, you often get the same components um, repeating, um, which is, uh, you know, we use this to take out duplication in organizations. So um, people often have a go at government. Uh, the worst example of uh, duplication I've got in government is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing. Um, and it happens to be uh, prisoner registration. We've managed to build that 118 different ways. Uh, and that's nothing compared to the private sector. Uh, in the private sector, I've got a pharma company, 350 different teams building enterprise content management systems. Uh, uh, a bank, risk management, we stopped counting at a thousand risk management systems. I mean, if you ever want waste and duplication, uh, you know, the private sector excels at this. I mean, you know, and the government is an amateur at waste uh, compared to the private sector, then, you know, because the private sector doesn't communicate with itself. Uh, in, in, internally within an organization, it doesn't have a mechanism to do so. Uh, so you always get huge amounts of duplication and waste. All right, so that's that exercise there. Great, thank you very much for doing that one. I'm gonna bring you on to another one, um, which uh, do, 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 is, oh, uh, right, this one here, robots. Uh, so this is an insurance company. I'll bring you all to me. Um, they needed, uh, they were going to invest a whole bunch of money into robots. That's, okay, why would you do so? Well, um, they need compute, they had order server, server goes into goods in, modified mount racket, that was their process flow. Uh, there was a bottleneck around modification uh, due to failing, uh, and the process uh, you know, was failing quite a bit. And there's an average cost of failure and all this sort of stuff. And they'd worked out that if they spent $2 million on robotics, they could actually um, uh, get rid of this bottleneck and then actually make a return investment in under one year. Sounds fantastic. So I'm going to give you uh, one minute to have a look at that and um, decide whether that's a sensible idea. We're going to do it by voting. So what I'm going to do is cover the yes, no with a vote. I'm going to give you one vote. You get one minute. Off you go. So I want you just to decide whether this sounds like a good idea. Would you invest the money, uh, given the fact it gets rid of the bottleneck and um, uh, a return investment sub one year? I'm going to tick. Oh, you vote by clicking the bottom right hand of the box. I'm going to vote yes. Do, 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 12 voted. 10 seconds left. All voted. Right, let's have a look. What did you decide? Do, 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 do. You decided. Uh, eight of you said yes. So the majority of you said yes, you would go and do it. All right. So this is a, uh, a real problem. It was back in 2010. 11, 12, something like that. Uh, they asked me to come along. I, you know, they'd spent six months working on this pro problem. Um, so you can't just go in and say, why well, are you using robots? Because they've got that entire story. They've got all the business case and everything else and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I asked them to map it. And they were like, oh, we don't want to, well, that sounds like a waste of time. Uh, they took 15 minutes and they went, uh, this is the map they created. User needs compute. They put compute product, order server, server goods in. Uh, and then compute needs a rack uh, and mount modified it. And so that's the map they created, literally 15 minutes. I'll give you one minute uh, in the gray box, um, put any post-it notes for any questions that you have on that map. Bring you all to me again just in case if i didn't ah right there we are we've got 
Why are they building their own racks? God, that was really fast. Um, there we are, 20 seconds. Um, so that was the question I asked them. Why, why have you got racks in custom built? And it turned out uh, that they had custom built racks. They had a company who made their racks. So I said, well, what are modifications you're making to service? Well, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit our racks. Uh, and um, that's why all these failures are occurring, yes. And that's, that's, that's why we need robotics. And of course, somebody immediately in the room just went, hang on a minute, why aren't we using standard racks? Um, and the reason why they weren't using standard racks is just past history, past story. And of course, you know, these people were trapped by context. You'll find organizations trapped by uh, a history all the time. And um, so what they're doing is they're, they're optimizing process flow, which is like, you know, this here, that's your process flow, and then optimizing that with the graph. And of course, what they should be doing is evolutionary flow. And so as soon as they realized actually that should be over here, it wasn't long before they went, oh, we, we better turn. We don't really, we're an insurance company. What, what the hell are we messing around with data sets? Well, we should be using cloud. Um, so it's lots of silly, simple things like this. Um, uh, you know, lack of focus on users, lack of understanding user needs, lack of understanding your supply chain components actually involved, lack of understanding how involved those components, uh, misapplication of methods, most contracts you find a flaw, people optimizing process flow rather than evolutionary flow. Um, all of these sorts of issues, uh, uh, they all stem from the fact that you don't understand your environment. And once you do, then you can start to learn all these wonderful patterns about identifying you know, where we've got duplication, so we better build something common here, how we effectively communicate. Maybe you want to drive components to a more industrialized state, so this is where we use open source, open plays, a uh, very powerful way of actually manipulating, changing the space to your favor, um, especially when you're competing against others who, who can't sit there. Now, I'm sure I must have run out of time, in which case I'm going to I've got some other examples, but um, um, yes, thank you, Simon. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> We've run out of time. No, I, we would love to hear more. And okay. um, I want to point out to people that um, Simon, that you have made all your content and methods and information and everything available openly, so everyone. Oh, it's all crazy comments, share alike, yeah, yeah, which is amazing. We love that here. So thank you so much. And to say that um, my favorite bits as well are the gameplay and the doctrine and all the various different other assets you have in there. So I would yeah. totally recommend people go find out more. It's 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 a brilliant set of content and. Great fun too. So I, I, I want to say a huge thank you, Simon, for joining us this morning. So My early. pleasure. Absolute yeah. delight. It is an absolute delight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.